Hello and welcome to Horse Live here from our small broadcasting studio at the Sitzenhof, the headquarters of Horsch in Germany. Well, we are into day three of Horsch Live and um, yet again we have been enjoying interesting uh, presentations today. The good news is there's more to come. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder on what is Horsch Live. Since COVID-19 is unfortunately still pretty much limiting us, on doing what we like doing best, and that is meeting with you in person, we found a way and we looked for a creative solution and found a way to interact with you anyway, and that is Horsch Live. And though we would have loved to have you in person today, this virtual format actually allows us and gives us the opportunity to present you an even larger and more international horse seminar ever. And in this context, I would like to specifically welcome all international and non-German speaking viewers. Before introducing our next guest, I would like to emphasize on one very important aspect of this. This is Horsch Live, and like I said, this is supposed to be an interaction. So in this regard, we hope to not only you hearing from us, but also us hearing from you. Please feel free to ask all your questions. Just write them in the chat feature of your streaming channel, and we will try to, to answer as many of those possible, either directly via the chat or live after the speaker's presentation. To our next speaker. The next two sessions will cover a topic that we as Horsch are dealing with for about a year now, and that is regenerative farming. One of the reasons why we kind of immediately had felt a profound sympathy for this topic is that it is all about soil. As you know, a key element in the history of Horsch, and still today, a main motivation for the company's actions. Well, resulting from this mutual excite or the excitement of a mutual passion, we have been intensively dealing with the topic, and those of you who follow us regularly might have noticed that we published a series on the of articles on the topic in uh, our customer's magazine, The Terra Horsch, and as blog post on our website. Those articles were written by Joel Williams. And Joel Williams will now join us for the first presentation. Joel is a Canadian-based independent plant soil, and soil health educator and healthy soil adv advocate. He provides lectures, workshops and consultation on soil management, plant nutrition and integrated approaches of sustainable food production. His workplace is the world. He's educating farming audiences internationally and worked on projects all around the globe. Resulting from projects in the UK, he's very familiar with the European farming and farming conditions. Now let us hear Joel outline on the ecological principles and infield practice of intercropping and highlight, cha cha highlight on changes that occur to soil health and pest pressure from the small transition from one to two crop species. Welcome, Joel. Okay, thanks very much. Real pleasure to be here at uh, Horsch Live. And today I'll be talking about some of the principles and practices behind intercropping. So let's dive straight into it. So, uh, what is intercropping? And firstly, it's to say that intercropping is generally defined as uh, growing two species or more together, multiple cropping, growing two species or more together in the same field, uh, mostly at the same time. So either planted or harvested together at the same time, or sometimes um, with different planting or harvesting dates. So perhaps that might be staggered through time. But the, the core of the idea is this stepping away from monocultural production into the beginnings of a more diverse production system and particularly that step from one to two is uh, to two species is the most common um, uh, practice associated with intercropping. Now there are a few different types or different um, styles or formats of intercropping. Uh, firstly, um, mixed intercropping would be uh, defined as growing multiple species all together in the same row, in the one row. So mixing those different plant, those two or more plant species and drilling them all down together into the one row. Uh, that differs from alternate row intercropping where you would then, as the name suggests, 
uh, modify the machinery, your drilling machinery, to uh, plant alternate rows of the two plant species, uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, for example. Um, so that's also become quite a, a common and, and popular method uh, to, to grow into crops. Uh, now we also have things like strip intercropping. Uh, this is where we would grow multiple rows of those multiple species. Again, usually two, but multiple rows of those two species that are spatially separated uh, in alternate rows. And I've got some images coming up next just to illustrate these. Then we have relay intercropping. This is also a style of strip intercropping that is again multiple rows of those species. Uh, again in alternate rows but the sowing dates are staggered through time so one is planted first and begins its life cycle another one is interceded or um, interdrilled in uh, at a separate point in time so drilled later and then equally it's hard the second species is harvested later as well and then we have things like uh, companion cropping. And companion cropping, in one sense, is not really a true intercrop. Uh, an intercrop generally is defined as kind of taking both through to harvest. Uh, but a companion crop is where you would have a secondary or an auxiliary plant species to grow uh, along with the main cash crop. So you're only going to take one cash crop through to harvest. Uh, but you might have a secondary plant species there to help or to support um, or to work in concert with uh, the main cash crop that you'll be taking through to harvest. Okay, so that's some of the, the different examples uh, or um, uh, uh, ways in which we can manage an intercrop. And here's some visuals just to explain these. So here we have uh, over on the left hand side we have some strip intercropping uh, that you can see here. So this is multiple rows of those two different species. And then over here in the middle we have the relay intercropping. Uh, so you can see that we start off by strip uh, by planting multiple rows in strips uh, with one species and then the second species is followed up or interceded uh, at a later point in time which equally carries through so that again the, the planting dates and the harvest dates are staggered through time okay and then we also have things like the alternate rows i mentioned and as the name suggests it's just alternate rows of each of the different plant species, the two plant species. And then this last example here is a mixed intercrop where uh, they're all mixed together into that one row. Okay, so that's kind of visually uh, what is, how uh, some of the intercrops are um, translated out into, into field conditions. And here's some uh, visual images of exactly that. The three images across the top you can see are the alternate row style where we have a cereal combined with uh, peas or uh, beans for example uh, and then down the below the bottom images you can see uh, we have um, more of the mixed style uh, all interplanted uh, style of intercropping where everything gets mixed all together less less structured um, planting arrangements uh, here's an example of a relay intercrop. Uh, the this is a winter wheat that would have been sown in the following in the previous fall in the previous autumn, uh, and then um, it would uh, have established go dormant through the winter, and then come the springtime these soybeans were uh, interceded uh, in the intero areas. So of course that wheat will be ready for maturity and for harvest uh, much sooner than the soybeans. Which, we, which will be ready later that following year. So uh, this is a relay intercrop where we are staggering the planting and harvest dates. And there's two quick examples here of a companion crop, uh, also sometimes called a temporary intercrop. Uh, here we have an example of a bean and cereal companion crop whereby the bean is then terminated through cultivation, through incorporation. Uh, so, of course, as we mulch down those beans uh, down into the soil, of course, they break down and uh, their, all of their nitrogen and other nutrients are released from within that decaying plant tissue to feed the main uh, cash crop, which we will take that one cash crop through to harvest. So you can see they were planted together, but at the end of the day, only one will be taken through to harvest. 
And we can also use, for example, selective herbicides to do this as well. So on the left hand side, you can see a oilseed rape or canola uh, combined with faba bean. And again, both these would have been drilled in the autumn, uh, established in autumn, dormancy through winter, and then come early spring, they will both uh, break that dormancy and begin growing again. And uh, the photo on the right you can see is after the farmer has uh, sprayed a selective herbicide to terminate the bean, which will now break down and uh, feed its nutrition to the oilseed rape, which will be the sole crop uh, carried onwards through to, to harvest. So these are examples of companion crops. And today we're going to focus a bit more on the intercropping uh, pic picture side of the puzzle. But we'll talk a little about both. But... So there are some underlying ecological principles involved in um, intercropping as to why we might bring together certain plant teams or certain plant partners, combinations of plants. And the underlying principle there is partly due to uh, facilitation. And this really just means whereby one species is facilitating the growth of the other. Uh, one species might be changing the environment, the microclimate, or changing the soil conditions, the nutrient availability in which the other one then can also um, be enhanced and, and support. So for example, these couple of images here on the left hand side, you know, one of these species might be a nitrogen fixer, so it's bringing in some nitrogen. Uh, another one of these species might be more of a uh, phosphorus solubilizer, phosphorus liberator, so it's cycling and making that phosphorus available. And uh, this last uh, grass species here, for example, this example, graminaceous plant here um, would be releasing uh, certain root exudates, uh, particularly in this example that would be called phytosiderophores. And these siderophores are root exudates that are renowned for chelating and grabbing onto iron and zinc, for example, and, and liberating them and making them available. So, so it's accessing micronutrients. Here we have some phosphorus liberation. Here we have some nitrogen fixation. So these different plants are changing the soil environment, changing the soil nutrient content, thereby facilitating the growth of the other species. And then we have this element of resource sharing where those plants ultimately uh, will share those resources and benefit and this is particularly true when those plants are mycorrhizal associating when we have uh, those plants interconnected through the common mycorrhizal networks whereby those uh, resources are, are shared much more um, efficiently and, and easily and then over on the right hand side we have uh, another principle at play here of complementarity or often called niche complementarity whereby uh, we are choosing the two plant teams to be rather um, have different growth habits uh, different um, uh, modes of action different ways in which they exploit the soil resources so you can see here the example of uh, a more shallower rooted plant more lateral branching roots uh, also the more prostrate growing habit they're more uh, open and um, uh, prostrate kind of leaf uh, structures uh, growth habit uh, versus the other plant which is obviously deeper rooted and more upright in its growth habit. Okay so of course therefore these two are not competing so much they're rather complementary uh, in terms of one is feeding more on the surface soil one is feeding more in the deeper soils and um, we have different, um, less competition for sunlight capture up in the above ground uh, uh, canopy architecture as well. So these are some of the underlying ecological principles in which we are trying to exploit and tap into uh, when we design a, an intercrop. And really the combinations then of plants that you can bring together is limited only by your imagination. I mean, the classic combination is a cereal and legume, and this is a great place to start if anybody was new to intercropping. Uh, this is a, a wonderful um, starting point, and you could combine, you know, any of these um, cereals with uh, any of these legumes, but, you know, there are certain classic combinations. I mean, wheat and Beans is a very common one, barley and peas or oats and peas, uh, these are particularly good combinations. Uh, maize with vetch also is a, a good one. I mean, clovers is an understory, is a companion with any of the cereals. 
uh, also works uh, very well. Uh, but equally, we could bring in other broad leaves, other oil seeds or brass, other brassicas, for example. But, um, you know, all seed rape to go with peas is, a, again, peola is a classic combination or beans equally for that matter. Um, linseed or flax can go with lentils or also chickpeas commonly in other parts of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, sunflowers also uh, do seem to go well with com companions of clover. So, but I mean, honestly, there is uh, endless combinations uh, that, that could be combined. And, and here's just a, a small list of examples of some of the common ones, particularly uh, seen throughout um, Europe. And then really the the crux of what we're trying to achieve within intercropping or part of what we're trying to achieve in terms of some of the below ground interactions is these root interactions, these root to root uh, interactions that, that take place. And what we're trying to exploit is the, is the fact that different plant species have different root architectures and they also release very specific and unique root exudates, a very specific composition of root exudates for uh, a legume versus a brassica versus a, uh, a rather broadly for a grass or a cereal, uh, etc. They're all unique in, in through their uh, composition of their root exudates. So here we're looking at just one small, simple example of that, looking at the pH. I mean, there'd be oodles uh, of other uh, uh, rich exudates and, and biochemicals that we could um, study and explore these differences. But if we just look at one very common and simple variable, pH, you can see that on the left hand side we have uh, a fava bean, and you can see that the fava bean's root exudates are driving that rhizosphere uh, down to a very acidic uh, root zone, uh, the, making the rhizosphere very acidic down around a pH of 4 or so, for example. Um, and over we have soybean in the middle and over on the right hand side we have maize and you can see that that maize is its root exudates are making that rhizosphere uh, more neutral uh, pH six and a half or seven for example in that more neutral condition so each different species has different exudates and that triggers different responses uh, different abilities to access and unlock nutrients in the soil different abilities to communicate uh, to various microbial species to recruit them or activate them uh, in the soil and uh, the obvious then the obvious opportunity here is, well, what if we brought a fava bean together uh, with the maize and we see those two different root systems begin to intermingle um, where they can then begin to benefit. So the maize can access some of that very acidic root zone of the fava bean and scavenge some of the trace minerals, for example, that are particularly available under acid conditions. And equally, the fava bean can uh, intermingle with the maize uh, root system and root rises here and access certain minerals that are more available under those neutral conditions such as calcium or magnesium or especially molybdenum, molybdenum being a critical nutrient for legumes um, to uh, support that nodulation process and, and the nitrogen fixation process. So um, opportunities await when we bring two different plants, plant species together. And, and this is an image really illustrating the exact same point. When we have a monoculture on the uh, left-hand side, uh, you can see that you know, it has this particular composition of root exudates. It has a particular ability to access, unlock certain nutrients and communicate with microbes. But when we bring in a second species, a second plant species, it has a different suite of exudates, a different ability to activate and recruit different groups of microbes. And when those root systems are in close enough proximity, then they can benefit from the, uh, each other's root exudates. They can benefit from that activation. And, and really what we then also see when we um, kind of take a deeper dive into some of these soil microbiome interactions is that there is a real synergy at play here whereby one plus one equals three, uh, where the sum is, is uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so, you know, the two different root ex exudation patterns and processes uh, have a, a much greater benefit in terms of plant health, nutrient cycling, uh, etc. Uh, now, one quick example, as I mentioned, the classic, one of the classic intercrops are uh, legume and cereal. And uh, as much as we often think that legumes uh, contribute most of their nitrogen to 
uh, their other crops when the legume dies, uh, when it decays and breaks down. Uh, and that is true. The bulk of the nitrogen from a legume is shared that way, you know, obviously in the next rotation for the next crop. Um, however, there is real-time sharing of nitrogen from legumes to non-legume companions. Um, and, uh, okay, it's a smaller amount than the, the decay of the biomass, but still, um, it is another piece of the puzzle in which the legumes can help their non-legume companions. And we see that legumes do excrete a lot of nitrogen-bearing rutexidates, so amino acids primarily, some other small um, proteins called peptides in which the legumes are excreting. And when they excrete those as rutexidates, the non-legume can absorb those, can scavenge those through their root system. So the more the, the cereal or the grass is scavenging that nitrogen, actually the more that keeps the legume turned on, uh, keeps the legume uh, fixing nitrogen uh, and keeps its nitrogen fixation rates up. So actually legumes fix more nitrogen with a non-legume companion than they do with a, a monocultural uh, legume, for example. So that's one pathway. Uh, but then also, if both plant species are mycorrhizal associators, then we also see direct transfer of nitrogen, again, usually in the form of amino acids, directly transferred through the mycorrhizal fungi, through the common mycorrhizal network, uh, to the non-legume plant. So we see this direct transfer of nitrogen uh, through mycorrhizal, so they also play a, a, a role in supporting the um, synergy that emerges from uh, the interactions between intercropping root systems. And here's one study that looked at exactly at this. We're looking at, a, again, a fava bean and a wheat intercrop and looking at the role of mycorrhizal fungi in supporting nitrogen fixation and nitrogen sharing. And so this first graph here on the left, we're looking at, first off, just the mycorrhizal colonization of the root systems of the wheat or the fava bean. And let's start with the wheat here. You can see that when wheat was grown as a monoculture, here's our baseline. This is about the uh, mycorrhizal colonization of the root system here. And when we added uh, the fava bean and grew that as a mixture, as per the blue bar here, um, you can see that we saw a, a, a bit of an increase in the overall mycorrhizal association of the wheat root system, simply by having a bean companion there, it enhanced the mycorrhizal colonization of that wheat. Uh, now if we look at the fava bean, also the same, uh, the monoculture fava bean, its baseline uh, mycorrhizal colonization was around about 40% here, and you can see that when we then added the wheat as a companion, there was a, a much more uh, significant increase in the overall mycorrhizal colonization of the fava bean when the wheat was also present. So clearly, uh, the more diverse mixtures, the two species seems to enhance that overall mycorrhizal colonization of the, of the root systems. And then if we look over on the right-hand side to the nitrogen fixation, we're just looking at the fava bean here and looking at the nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, uh, looking at the nitrogen fixation potential of that legume. And you can see that uh, when the legume was grown as a monoculture, uh, under a pure stand, you can see that with or without mycorrhizal fungi, uh, there was not particularly a, any difference. Um, the bean would fix about this amount of nitrogen, 20 odd percent was derived from the atmosphere, and whether or not it was inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi or not didn't influence that. However, when that bean was again grown as a com with a companion uh, with wheat in this example, you can see that actually then when we have the diverse mixture, the intercropping scenario, plus the mycorrhizal fungi inoculant, you can see that that induced a greater amount of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere, higher levels of nitrogen fixation in that bean, simply by having the companion uh, and mycorrhizal fungi on top of that. And again, that's partly because of that mycorrhizal fungi was being a uh, conduit and trans helping to transfer nitrogen from the legume to the cereal, to the wheat, and thereby that loss of nitrogen from the legume uh, helps to keep the nitrogen fixation up and, and keeps nitrogen fixation turned on.
Okay, so uh, indeed there's a real synergy when we bring in some of the biological aspects of the, the soil, uh, soil microbiome as well within intercropping systems. So here's a, just, I put this up just purely for interest's sake, a neat image of um, visually tracking a, the, develop, the development of an intercropping, uh, a cereal legume intercrop through various kind of growth stages. So you can see uh, when we're starting off after drilling, we have some small young plants across the top here. Um, and then through the middle, they begin to establish. Uh, and onwards, again, from the, the right to left, uh, sorry, the left to right um, on its way to maturity there. So we can see those different kind of stages uh, of, um, of the canopy development of an alternate row legume uh, cereal intercrop. Now let's have a look at some other examples uh, of intercrops commonly grown, for example, in Europe. I mean, there's oodles of them, but I'm just choosing a, few, a bit of a selection here. Here we have an example of uh, oilseed rape and fava bean. Uh, the combination often called fabola. Uh, here we have peola, a classic combination of peas and, and uh, all seed rape or canola. Uh, you can see them growing happily together. Uh, here's an example of more of a, a companion crop, perhaps. You can see this is a clover uh, underseeded into, uh, under into some oats. And uh, as the oats come off through the combine there, um, the clover is left to, to keep that soil cover or of course could be used for some autumn grazing uh, for livestock in integrated producers as well. Uh, here's an example of pea and barley, also a classic combination, a really good starting out combination. And here's some strip intercropping of again, faba bean. Um, with maize or with uh, wheat um, in, in a strip intercropping style, multiple rows of those two different species uh, in an alternating pattern. And uh, here we have an example from Australia um, in a lower moisture climate. Intercropping is um, perhaps still um, in development in some of the drier areas. There's still some concern about moisture limitations. Uh, and so here's an example of just perhaps more of a low population of that fava bean uh, throughout a, a cereal field, uh, a wheat field in this example. But, um, and you can see that uh, that's no doubt providing some nitro fixation, some uh, benefits to changes in the microclimate and that root exudation, et cetera, that we discussed. So just a, a kind of lower population density there, um, which is you know, still used also in dry climates. And here we have uh, one last example of clover and uh, maize. And you can see interceded early on, uh, not long after establishment of the maize, and then after the maize harvest on the right-hand side, we have a wonderful uh, uh, understory living mulch cover uh, with that clover. Okay, so that's just some practical examples. There are many more, uh, as I said, but that was just a bit of a selection for a visual cue there. Let's move on to some of the literature and look at some of the studies. Um, on uh, that have emerged in, in intercropping. And again, actually, there are oodles, tons of studies, so many studies underway looking at intercropping. There's great traction, really good to see great traction in looking at the potential of these more diverse cropping systems. And okay, here's a, here's a, a chart illustrating that increase um, in uh, intercropping studies. Uh, which is uh, excellent, uh, really excellent to see. And so just choosing a small selection of those just to illustrate some interesting examples and changes that happen when we transition from that monoculture from one to two species, how that can change from various kind of soil uh, and um, pest and disease um, activities. So we'll share a few studies looking at that have explored this. Okay, so the first one here, we're looking at changes in soil carbon and soil nitrogen from intercropping. And this is from a uh, seven year study um, over comparing over seven years, a seven year rotation versus seven years of intercropping and uh, strip intercropping in this example. And they found that the intercropping system, uh, that the soil organic carbon in the intercropping system was 4% uh, higher in the intercropping system. And they also found that the nitrogen content in the intercropping system was 11% uh, higher than the monoculture, than the monocultural rotation uh, otherwise. So uh, intercropping seems to improve uh, soil carbon and nitrogen dynamics. 
And here's an interesting one looking at phosphorus. And this was an interesting study. It's with soybeans and wheat, but I, I chose this one because it's an interesting one looking at growing into crops under both P phosphorus sufficiency and phosphorus uh, deficiency uh, limiting um, scenarios to see what impacts uh, an intercrop might have. And so here they were comparing soybean and wheat uh, grown both as a monocrop and as an intercrop uh, and then comparing that under P sufficient deficiency and P sufficiency um, conditions. And uh, what they found is that the total root dry weight the root length and the root surface area were all significantly increased under the P deficient conditions when the wheat and soybean were intercropped together. Now, of course, uh, root dry weight, root length and root surface area, all rooting traits and rooting characteristics are dependent on phosphorus. Phosphorus is a critically important nutrient for good root development. So here what we've illustrated is that even under phosphorus limiting conditions uh, that actually those intercrops can help overcome that phosphorus limitation and, uh, and still enhance rooting traits and rooting characteristics um, of those plant species uh, even under uh, where that um, critical nutrient resource was, was limiting. So um, it opens up some really interesting opportunities for use of intercrops in lower input systems, in uh, more nutrient um, deprived uh, agroecosystems in which it, it, indeed it seems intercrops seem to work very well. Now intercrops can also even influence the soil physical condition, uh, the soil structure, the soil aggregation. Here we have a comparison of a maize and fava bean intercrop compared to monocrops and looking at some of the physical properties, particularly aggregation. So here they were looking at um, the presence of uh, macro aggregates where there is a suggestion that <clears throat> intercrops can improve the aggregation but uh, the exact modes of action perhaps less uh, well understood. And the results of looking at aggregation under monoculture verse intercropping systems with maize and fava, they showed that those aggregates in, um, increased in the intercropping systems by anywhere from 15 up to just under 60%. Um, across the three sites and across the two years. So obviously a bit of variability there, um, but different sites and soil types and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, the, the intercropping situation, uh, cropping system did improve aggregation by a minimum of 15% and anywhere up to 60 odd percent. So, and really what they then boiled that down to was that intercropping alters the soil microbial communities and it is those microbes through the release of their microbial metabolites, their various glues, microbial gluey substances, they had to glue those soil particles together to build those aggregates. So it was through, and the increase in aggregation was through an indirect stimulation of the soil microbes, and then they helped to glue those particles together and, and increase aggregation. So even, there we go, changes to the soil physical condition can also emerge from just this small step from one to two plant species is one step away from a monoculture. And here's another example of just tapping into this discussion around drier conditions, um, which one never knows uh, based on the past three or so years in Europe. Um, it's been a bit drier and maybe this will be an ongoing trend and maybe studies like this will be quite important um, in a future uh, resilient agriculture. And this was just a pot trial, but a really interesting one, combining a pigeon pea, deep-rooted pigeon pea, with a shallow-rooted finger millet. Now, they grew these in the one pot, but the finger millet was grown in a, a mesh bag, um, in which, therefore, the roots, all the root hairs, fine root hairs, could not um, integrate and could not communicate through that fine mesh bag. It was a barrier to exclude the roots from each other. Now, then they imposed, they established these two plants and then imposed a drought, but at the bottom of the pot they did have a, a water well. So the deep rooted pigeon pea could access that moisture and bring that up, but the shallow rooted uh, finger millet, um, which doesn't have as deeper roots, does not get down to that uh, water reservoir. Um, and so the drought conditions imposed from above, from the top, uh, induced significant reductions in the biomass of the finger millet. Now, however, where they then added 
mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhizal fungi being much finer, high for filaments, they can pass through that membrane, pass through that barrier. Now the mycorrhizal fungi were connecting the pigeon pea and the finger millet together. Okay, so what we then found was that the pigeon pea would tap into the subsoil moisture, it would bring it up and actually it would share it through the mycorrhizal fungi to the finger millet. And what they showed was, that, again, of course, a drought was imposed on the top from the surface, but in this instance, the finger millet uh, increased biomass production because it was able to access water indirectly through the pigeon pea which they then termed uh, bio-irrigation. Okay, so just an interesting one on some of the water use dynamics there that uh, could be interesting for intercropping systems. And I'll just this one very quickly to also say that plants release a, a host of volatile organic compounds. These are aromatics, smells and scents, uh, in which plants will release these volatile uh, organic compounds um, in which they also indeed do communicate to each other. Uh, so within a companion or intercropping scenario, one species can be releasing certain volatile organic compounds that the other one can land on the other one, that the other one can detect, um, and it can indeed trigger um, various interactions between the two plants. And as this study was highlighting, um, certain microbes in, that associate around one plant um, can actually induce the uh, release of specific, root, uh, specific volatile organic compounds that the other partner can receive, and it can then induce changes down in its uh, root, it changes in its root exudates, and then changes in the, in the associated soil microbiome beneath that equally. So, uh, indeed, there's a whole other aspect to intercropping, uh, not just their root interactions, but how they interact through some of these volatile organic compounds as well. Okay, so let's shift gears and look at a few studies on pest management um, on insects, uh, diseases, insects, and, uh, and weeds. And here's an interesting study that was a review study looking at a, a host of other studies, 200 specifically, where they were looking at some of the impacts of, on diseases or disease pressure uh, when comparing intercropping systems versus monocultures. And they found that from those 200 studies that 73% of the time uh, intercropping systems led to a reduction in disease pressure. Okay, now that's not to say that was a 73% reduction in disease pressure, but 73% of the time there was a lowering of uh, disease pressure by varying degrees, um, uh, indeed. But uh, overall, the trend there um, is that intercropping systems do improve uh, disease resistance. And here's a table from that same study, just looking at, again, some of the different diseases, fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, uh, for example. So here we're looking at what percent of the time, what percent of the studies ultimately led to a reduction. And you can see that, you know, again, 79% of the time um, uh, fungal diseases were reduced, 100% of the time bacterial reduces were reduced. 72% uh, of the time viral diseases were reduced and it's nematodes is the one that is perhaps less so. Uh, intercropping systems may enhance some of the root feeding nematode problems um, that seems to be less prevalent um, from a nematode point of view but all of the other diseases there seem to trend in the right direction that um, overall there's a lowering disease pressure uh, with intercropping systems when we compare um, to soil crop and, and monocultural systems. And so here's another review study that was also looking at a host of other studies, uh, specifically disease, but also looking at the mode of action, the mechanism of action. And really what they found is that the key factor that is really driving most of this reduction um, of uh, disease pressure is host dilution. Uh, so simply, you know, when we cut the plant population, for example, in half and put another plant species in that mix, um, that lowering of the seeding rate, uh, that lowering of the dent or the density of the canopy or the foliage, these kinds of things, um, that lowering of the host, uh, diluting of that host with another plant species seems to be the, the major factor that's driving some of these improvements in the uh, disease reduction, but equally other factors like allelopathy and um, physical barriers and things can also play a role. Okay, 
Uh, now, an interesting example here, looking at uh, uh, insects, uh, insect pests, uh, and this is touching on that volatile organic compounds again, whereby plants can release some of these smells and scents, um, and they can land on uh, the other plant partner and induce very unique responses in the plant. So um, there's two modes of action here whereby those uh, volatile organic compounds uh, indeed do land on the leaf, so surface adsorption onto the leaf, um, and those uh, through that pathway can in actually help to hide the plant or mask the plant from uh, herbivores, from insect pests, um, so they can actually make the plant invisible. Um, and equally, the, some of those volatile organic compounds can actually be uh, breathed in through the stomata of the companion plant. It'll actually uh, take them in through the stomata where they can then have more internal or induced resistance responses, uh, turning on uh, various immune compounds and, and immune defense chemicals uh, within the companion plant as well. So uh, they've shown that uh, those can help with against both insect pests, um, but also pathogens uh, equally as well. Uh, so a bit of a combination there. So some of these volatile compounds playing a really important role as well as something that's generally overlooked within intercropping systems, but uh, something that will become more and more um, yeah, interesting and, res and more researched at a deeper level uh, moving forward. And uh, here we have a neat example of just zooming in at some of these trichomes on some of the plants and you can see these uh, these glandular trichomes in which we can see some of these essential oils and volatile organic compounds uh, being produced here at the tips of these uh, where they will then um, uh, volatilize off and disperse off in the air and uh, send these triggering messages to other plants or attract in beneficial insects or deter beneficial insects, these kinds of things, uh, which is what some of these examples are illustrating. And one last example on weeds. Uh, can intercrops help with weed problems? And uh, again, there's a range of different studies on this and a whole bag of mixed results, but generally the answer seems to be yes. Uh, indeed, they, they do help. And this was a study looking at legume companions, um, particularly legume companions uh, for intercropping systems to suppress weeds. And here they are comparing 34 studies, looking at 476 observations, and considering all of these experimental units together, the companion plants had no significant effect on cash crop yield, but they significantly decreased the weed biomass uh, by 56% relative to a non-weeded control and 42% relative to a weeded control. So, you know, either way, overall, um, really quite a significant reduction in the weed pressure from the use of these legume companions. However, as they acknowledge, you know, the conditions that give rise to these kind of win-win scenarios uh, we do have some knowledge gaps. This does need to be explored further to facilitate the further adoption of the practice. So hey, nonetheless, the evidence is there. Yes, uh, intercropping systems can uh, um, lead to lower weed pressures, but um, certainly there are some nuances and mechanisms there in which we need to understand um, to um, increase that, that repeatability um, of that effect. And one last study looking at more bigger picture, the role of intercropping in um, more broadly, broadly speaking, the sustainable uh, intensification of agriculture. And uh, this was an interesting, again, meta-analysis looking at lots of other intercropping studies and looking at many different um, aspects or multifunctions of those intercropping systems. So uh, a few highlights I'll read out here. We carried out the first global meta-analysis on the multifaceted benefits of intercropping. And from 126 studies, over 900 observations, uh, when all was compared, sole cropping versus intercrops, uh, when compared to the same area of land that was managed in monoculture, uh, intercrops produced 38% more gross energy uh, and 33% more gross income for the farmers, uh, all whilst using 23% less land. Okay, so it's pretty much multiple wins there. Um, more yields uh, in terms of energy as they were expressing it. Uh, more income for the farmers, also whilst using less land. 
thereby obviously lowering our footprint um, on on uh, the wider ecology and opening up those opportunities to to use that land for habitat or other um, um, you know other purposes. Okay, so in summary, uh, just a few pros and cons to intercropping. Certainly on the benefit side, um, over-yielding is possible. Uh, we do see a lot of intercropping, but it's not a given. You know, plants can be competitive sometimes, so there can be reduced yields uh, seen in an intercropping system. It is a case-by-case -case scenario, but uh, overall, I'd say there's plenty of examples out there of over-yielding where we actually increase the, the yields through uh, intercropping systems. Uh, certainly reduced inputs is a big one. When we bring a legume in as a companion, we're getting free nitrogen. Nitrogen inputs immediately can be lowered. Some of our other inputs can also be lowered uh, through that phosphorus scavenging, trace element scavenging, those kinds of things. And certainly many of our uh, plant protection products can certainly be lowered um, through that lowered pest pressure that we also talked about with some of those studies. So um, savings on both fertilizer inputs and also um, plant protection. Uh, certainly better um, risk management associated with intercropping. So this can help with all sorts of factors. You know, putting two crops out there at once, you don't know if it's going to be drier, wetter, hotter, cooler. Uh, maybe there's uh, some variability in the field, high spots, low spots. Um, and you know, by drilling the two crops, you might find that one of them dominates in the low spot, but another one of them dominates in the high spot, or one dominates when it's cooler or hotter or cold, or wetter or drier, etc., etc. So you know, at least you will get something that will uh, establish and um, generate a, a yield come harvest time, uh, rather than having nothing uh, in those poorer areas or if the season goes the wrong way. So from a risk management point of view, there's a a ton of benefits to intercropping systems. And uh, lastly, improving biodiversity. You know, that step away from monoculture uh, is a big benefit. Um, taking steps towards agricultural, more agricultural biodiversity is, um, you know, widely accepted as a, as a, as a good thing. So, um, you know, opening up those opportunities for greater biodiversity is certainly a benefit uh, in field, you know, to intercropping systems. Uh, most certainly. Okay, on the negative side, as I touched on, okay, plants can be competitive. We do need to find good plant teams, good plant partners, the right varieties, the right seeding rates. These things are critically important. So just to optimize that process towards over yielding rather than um, competing and reduced yield. So there are variables there that we need to look at, and that's part of one of the negatives is these agronomic complexities. You know, it's the complexity of then managing rotations, again, plant protection products, and again, seeding rates or seeding depths, these kinds of things. Um, there's a whole host more, certainly, of agronomic complexities associated with intercropping versus monocultures. Uh, harvest and separation. It can go both ways. Um, harvest can be easier, uh, so less lodging with intercropping. So legumes are notorious for falling on the ground. Um, if they have a cereal upper or some kind of an upright companion uh, that can act as a scaffold, then that can hold and support those legume crops up off the ground for easier harvest. Um, but uh, equally, yeah, there are also some other challenges with harvesting if the, if the two plants are not ripe and mature at the same time uh, when they go through the combine maybe some of the seeds shattering or uh, chipping and thrashing that kind of thing so um, some problems around harvesting are also prevalent um, and of course then separation uh, separating those seeds uh, after harvest can be a bit of a headache it depends what setup you've got if you've got the right gear it's no problem but uh, this can be a problem linking into the final point here on markets and market access and having contaminants. You know, if you've got some pea chips in a cereal or um, other allergens, you know, mustards in, in other cereals or that kind of thing, um, there are concerns around market access. So uh, less of an issue on the feed market, but for human consumption, it can be more of a concern. So there are certainly some market and value chain kind of barriers that exist, but Equally, there's some value chain opportunities from intercropping systems as well. So. Okay, so that's um, a, a bit of a broad overview of really some of the principles, the practice, some practical examples, some of the science, some of the evidence, and uh, wrap it off there with just some closing comments on the benefits and um, some of the uh, current barriers to intercropping systems. So. 
Okay, happy to take some questions now. Yeah, and now joining us uh, live from Canada, Joel Williams. Good morning, Joel. Good morning and good, af good afternoon to you. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, thank you very much for this very interesting um, insights into intercropping. Um, and I guess um, just uh, right away with some questions. So the first one we got here from a viewer um, that is uh, doing a trial on relay cropping with soybeans and barley. And um, the question is, um, about seeding conditions. So uh, the viewer is asking whether he should wait until the optimal seeding conditions and risk the damage on barley um, when seeding soy, or should they get uh, the soy in as early as possible? Um, or, on the other hand, um, um, yeah, by going as early as possible, risk plant loss by, uh, because of late and uneven emerge of the soybeans because of soil temperature. Yeah, that's a, indeed, that's a tricky one and a good question illustrating also some of the challenges that intercropping poses. You know, it, it does bring about some greater complexities uh, in the management, um, the agronomic management of those uh, in those cropping scenarios. And that's a, a really good example. And it's, you know, that's a tricky question to answer. It's really going to depend on the, I think, the farmer's own um, observation and tuition of, of the conditions there. Um, I think the, that really um, you could look at, I guess you'd have to ask what's the more important crop? Is it got one that's perhaps more important than the other? And maybe that might lean towards which to prioritize. Yeah. Um, but also look at the conditions of the barley. Does it look hardy? Does it look like maybe it could tolerate uh, a little bit of that damage, uh, for example, or equally, he could maybe compensate the soy seeding rate for some of that uneven loss and maybe increase the seeding rate okay. a little to, to maybe compensate. So, yeah, that's a that's a tricky question and one to answer. And I think that um, that would have to be a, a case by case scenario there. But mm -hmm. um, you could do either way. If I if I understand you right, with the main with the main focus on what's what's the major crop, what's what's the more important crop and, 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 and orientate your system on that. Exactly, yeah. exactly right. And that's uh, that's a common practice in yeah. intercropping. Yeah. Uh, you might kind of, of course, it might then look at the market prices yeah. and the overall economic potential and um, of, of which one is your leading or leader or, or primary crop. And so often you might then really try to continually through those through those agronomic complexities, try to always be optimizing the one that perhaps is the more valuable or, or more profitable crop at the end. So, and of course that can change from season to season. Yeah, so sure. um, yeah. that, that's a way to, to a way to tackle it. Yeah. All right. So thank you for that answer. And I hope that uh, our viewer now understands a little better of um, um, how to do that and, and, and it helps him and answers his question. Um, a next question that we got um, um, is regarding bending of fertilizer um, when going or uh, when doing cereals and legumes. Um, the question is, would you recommend bending and fertilizer on the cereal if you have legumes and cereals, or is there no need for this because of nitrogen transfer? Yeah, good question. And um, yeah, there's a mixed bag of answers to that, you know, and it really depends on what your yield um, goals and your yield potential of that cereal is. But I would say that it's very common to use no fertilizer. Certainly over here in Canada, um, as soon as a farmer is doing a legume-based intercrop, it's very common for them to cut nitrogen out completely. Okay. And of course, that pre presents a wonderful opportunity to lower those inputs and, and look at those economic savings. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's very common. Uh, and yes, there is potential to transfer the nitrogen, as I discussed in the lecture. Um, but often this may not be enough for you know full... Um, supply to the cereal for, for really particularly big yield. So there could be some advantages to putting a little bit of N down. And of course, yes, I would band that if I were to put any down uh, underneath just the cereal. Um, so you will get some transfer, definitely. It may or may not be enough. It's a mixed bag of what people do. Uh, the other thing I would suggest in this example is something like a foliar nitrogen. Uh, one of the benefits to a foliar nitrogen is that you can then again deliver that nitrogen to the cereal um, without it negatively influencing the legume. Actually, legumes respond quite well to a foliar nitrogen. It doesn't seem to affect their nodulation. Um, so that could also be another opportunity 
to judge in real time. If the farmer feels that the cereal looks a little hungry, that it needs a little boost uh, as it goes through that season, you could top it up with a foliar nitrogen there as well um, and, and really wait and, and yeah, play the game, play the season as it comes and, and um, react accordingly through that strategy as well. Okay. When doing that folio, is there um, anything to, to specifically consider uh, in terms of amount of, of nitrogen or is there anything that one has to, to, be, to have in mind? In that context, yeah, sure, yeah, I would, I would highly recommend the use of urea specifically as a foliar. Um, it's a, a form of nitrogen that's very um, efficient and very conducive to, to rapid uptake, rapid absorption, and it's a very efficient form to then be converted in, into uh, proteins um, for the plant. So uh, I would use something like urea, and a, a typical application rate might be around about 10 or 15 kgs of product yeah. per hectare something in that vicinity. And actually, even on legumes, they've shown that the foliar sprays of urea uh, boosts the protein content uh, without uh, negatively affecting that end fixation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, mm -hmm. Another question um, is regarding the number of crops, um, the, of crop species um, going along with each other, uh, accompanying each other. Um, when I introduced you prior to your presentation, um, I said um, that small transition from one crop species to a set to two crop species and when watching your um, uh, your lecture um, I realized and I guess uh, a lot of our viewers as well that that one could even do more when doing intercropping more than just uh, two species so is there in that regard anything is there the perfect number of crop species um, that accompany each other um, and 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 what is the advantages of going with more than two um, can you maybe give us a little more insights on that Mm. Sure thing, yeah. I, I think uh, the most common is two, and that's, I think, because of ease. Uh, the, you know, the more numbers that you introduce, of course, that, that introduces greater and greater complexity, um, trying to manage all of the agronomics of each of those species. So it gets very complex very quickly, and I think that's why two has become the most common number. And certainly if anyone was starting out or new to intercropping, I would definitely start there. Um, and I think that's um, that's a, a really good spot to start. And there, are, as I highlighted in the lecture, there are some some benefits to that, uh, many benefits just from that small step. But that said, yeah, you could go more. Um, I know uh, three is also fairly common. Um, moving above three, I think, is more difficult. Uh, I think it, that has applicability if you're growing. You could do more five or even more um, if your end depends on your end market. And if you were growing those grains, for example, for animal feed, you know, chicken feed, where you're quite happy to have a bit of a random mix of grains, no set kind of ration per se there, but just a more of a diverse mix. I think in that kind of an end use, you could certainly go beyond three and up to five or six, etc. Um, and certainly if you were grazing, if you were grow, growing those intercrops more as a forage, yeah. of course, that also becomes very, very easy in that sense, yeah. too. I think the key point to stress is not necessarily the number of species per se. It's about having functional diversity. You want a difference of species that have different functions. So, you know, you wouldn't keep adding more cereals, even if you've already got one. You wouldn't keep adding more legumes if you've already got a legume. So it's about having, for example, one legume, one cereal, maybe one other broad leaf, maybe one brassica or another broad leaf, you know, maybe a grass uh, as a companion or yeah. something like that. You know, it's, you're really, you're about, you're looking for the different functions of each of those steps, not necessarily an increase in the number per se for the sake of the number. Yeah. It's for the sake of the function. That's really what you've got to focus okay. on. And um, um, is availability of nutrition of nutrients for for the primary crop becoming an issue when I'm going with more species? Um, having, yeah, the the the, the nutrition that the primary crop is needing available at the right time. Mm, yeah, that's right, and that's that again is part of those greater complexities yeah. that get introduced. Yeah. But uh, it can go both ways, you know. So the plants they can be very. Um, collaborative, and we, are, we talked about some of those ecological principles in the lecture, but they, if, of course, they can be competitive too. You know, those other plants, they can be competing for moisture, uh, competing for nutrients. And, and that's why it's, it's really important to design the intercrop with that functional diversity in mind um, and really optimizing some of that niche complementarity 
deeper, shallow rooters, uh, that kind of thing, legumes for nitrogen, you know, grasses for micronutrient release. Yeah. If you're optimizing those kinds of functional diversities, that's where you open up the opportunity for more of the synergies. But, but yes, you're right, it can, competition can be a real factor. Uh, there can be problems associated with that. And I think it's therefore it is important to to maybe, um, you know, look to your local research institutes and in your area, what other farmers are doing. Start with the basic recipes and the combinations that are working in field that we know about. Start with some of those classics. And again, the cereal legume would be one of those classics, easy starting place. And then really, I think it's I would encourage farmers to do that little bit of trial and error on small areas of their farms yeah. uh, and, and try some different combinations and, and find the mixes that work. And importantly, share that knowledge, you know, um, amongst farmer networks and, and grow groups yeah. um, and exchange what's working for, for others. And yeah, I think the use of online resources, social media, networking groups is, is really important to, to share that information. Um, Joel, unfortunately, we just have time for one more question, and I guess that needs to be a quick one. Um, but you just mentioned sharing information. Um, when I introduced you, um, uh, I mentioned that you're kind of a global citizen uh, from, from, from what I know. Um, you've seen so many farming systems and, 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 and educated so many farmers already around the world. Where, now, looking at Canada and, and, and Europe, um, where do you see Europe in terms of intercropping? Um, where where are we uh, stay? Where are we right now? And, and and where do you see the future intercropping in Europe? And and maybe specifically with regard to high and intensively producing areas um, like northern Germany or parts of, of the UK. I guess um, we might have been we might have viewers from the UK right now. Um, I mean, where where there's highly intensive systems. So it, and then as you covered in your lecture, it, it needs to make sense economical from the economical point of view as well, right? So where do you see, just maybe in one or two sentences, where do you see uh, Europe there and, and when you compare it with a kind of intensive system as well in Canada? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of traction in intercropping and actually both Europe and Canada, I would put both these two countries or these two regions um, among the leaders of the world uh, right now in intercropping. There's a lot of traction in both. And I was very encouraged just a few weeks ago there was a wonderful uh, conference uh, on intercropping intercropping for sustainability uh, which was hosted in the uk but featured researchers all across europe and i was very encouraged to see both the breadth and depth of research that's happening at the moment in intercropping looking at you know varieties specifically for this you know nutrient management for this developing tools to overcome some of those agronomic complexities there is a ton of research happening in intercropping right now, uh, especially in a European context. I'd say from a research point of view, mm -hmm. Europe is uh, much further ahead. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of at the field application level, there's some really good farmers here in Canada who are also embracing the practice and, and using those in-field learnings. So, um, and I think there is a lot of opportunity to intensify. I don't think it'd be that a high input or an intensive system versus low input. I think actually both of those systems have uh, excellent opportunities to integrate intercropping um, with those two goals in mind. Intercropping can help lower inputs um, through the through over yielding. Um, uh, intercropping can also improve the in intensification of the production system, but do it in a slightly more biodiverse way. So I think intercropping has huge applicability across the board. Okay. Very interesting. So, seems uh, sounds to me like we're uh, this will be a topic we'll be talking about uh, more often in the future. So, um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, um, hope to talk to you again soon on this topic. And uh, until then, have a great day um, and a good time and all the best. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah to all viewers, um, that was Joel Williams. Um, with his uh, speech on intercropping. Um, we will continue um, with another speaker on intercropping just in about two minutes, um, so not that much time. Um, I hope to see you again then, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye.